Welcome to My Vaccine is Jesus. Today's discussion is in the response to J.W. Comet's Questions and Objections playlist and is entitled Episode 23. Before we begin, a short prayer. A blessing, honor, glory, and worship to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, for now and forever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. I pray to Almighty God to be filled with the Holy Spirit, so I'm empowered to speak truth without error and to interpret Holy Scripture correctly. All truth comes from God, and the errors are my own. I also pray that you, the viewer and listener, may likewise be filled with the Holy Spirit so that any truth I speak or any scripture that I interpret correctly is welcomed in your heart, your mind, and your soul. Now let us begin the discussion. It's a set of comments I received to that video above. It's from a brute, who I assume is a Jehovah's Witness. The first comment regarding this video was, Poll, Numbers, chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. And then here's some comments to me that I've put together. The sign would have been above his head and hands. Each gospel miss out details. Luke states his hands and feet. Only one verse states nails. Three gospels don't add that detail. Well, St. Peter died of old age. He couldn't look after himself. And then he continued re uh, related to that point. That is what the verse is saying. Peter in his old age couldn't take care of himself. He needed someone to guide him. He lost his independence. Read my comments on St. Peter. Read that verse again and again and again and again. Peter in his old age lost his independence. Then I guess he got frustrated with me. We are done. I have told you the truth. Okay. So let's look. This is all from JW.org. Let's start with Numbers chapter 21 verses 8 and 9. Then Jehovah said to Moses, make a replica of a poisonous snake and put it on a pole. Then when anyone has been bitten, he will have to look at it in order to keep alive. Moses at once made a serpent of copper and put it on the pole. And whenever a serpent had bitten a man and he looked at the copper serpent, he survived. So notice Moses made a serpent of copper and put it on the pole. Here's the problem. We don't know what that pole was shaped like. We don't know whether or not it had a cross beam, right? And if it did, that would fit with the cross. If it didn't, that doesn't disprove the cross necessarily, does it? Okay. Now let's look at the verses that I uh, uh, pointed out in the video there in the upper left that I think prove, based on scripture, that it had to be a cross and not a stake. Matthew 27, verse 37. They also posted above his head the charge against him in writing, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. It doesn't say above his head and hands. It doesn't say above his hands. It says above his head, which obviously fits with the cross and not a torture stake. Similarly, John chapter 20, verse 25. So the other disciples were telling him, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But he, Thomas, said to them, unless I see in his hands, plural, the print of the nails, plural, and stick my finger into the print of the nails, plural, and stick my hand into his side, I will never believe it. Notice, in his hands, the print of the nails, which, of course, goes along with a cross and not a stake. By the way, going to those comments over there in the left lower area, the idea that something's only true in Scripture if every single gospel describes it the same exact way with the same exact details, that's ridiculous, and believing that you don't believe the Bible right? Okay, so this idea that only one verse states nails, three gospels don't add that detail, each gospel miss out details. No, they don't miss out details. They're showing you truth from different perspectives. There's no contradictions. Again, many of these things that seem to be contradictions are because we don't understand something or because there's a spiritual meaning and a reason that the Holy Spirit inspired authors wanted to describe something from different perspectives to teach us something. And I have uh, three addendum videos about these points. So I'm going to spend this video describing this idea of St. Peter and old age and looking after himself, etc. First off, because remember the church teaches that St. Peter died as a martyr in Rome along with St. Paul subsequent to Nero burning the city and blaming the Christians. So. Now, of course, none of that is in Scripture. That's what the early church taught and recognized based on the promises in um, Matthew uh, uh, 16, Matthew 18, the promises of the Holy Spirit throughout John, the promises of knowing the truth and spreading it to disciples in certain epistles of St. Paul. 
The way I look at it, you have to believe that the early church knew the truth. Because if the early church didn't know the truth, those promises of Lord Jesus were false, which makes Lord Jesus either a liar or without power, both of which are blasphemy, or that the Holy Spirit couldn't uh, do what Lord Jesus promised, which again either makes Lord Jesus a liar or the Holy Spirit not having the power, which are all blasphemy. So that I think is a very important point. But there are things in Scripture that suggest this, that St. Peter was in Rome where he was crucified upside down, by the way, because that's what the early church teaches. Let's look at some of those verses. Mark chapter 15, verse 21. Because remember, the early church teaches that the gospel of Mark, right, was written by John Mark, and it was based upon the preaching in Rome of St. Peter. So Mark was with St. Peter. Verse 21, Mark chapter 15. Also they compelled into service a passerby, a certain Simon of Cyrene, coming from the countryside, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his torture stake. Notice that detail. And again, going back to our commenter's point, well, they don't mention this in every single gospel, so it can't be true. Ludicrous. Now notice that name, Rufus. So this individual had to have some import, right? Interesting. Romans chapter 16 This is St. Paul writing to believers in Rome. And notice, verse 13, Greet Rufus, the chosen one in the Lord, and his mother and mine. So Rufus was in Rome. Ah, isn't that interesting? Acts chapter 12, verse 12. This is after Peter was released from the prison by the angel. After he, Peter, realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was called Mark, where quite a few were gathered together and were praying. So notice the first time we hear about John Mark, who the church teaches that wrote the Gospel of Mark, obviously, Peter is going to his mother's house. 1 Peter 5, verse 13, She who is in Babylon, a chosen one like you, sends you her greetings, as, and so does Mark, my son. Now, if you go back to Daniel, where there's a description of this statue with the head of gold, right? So that head represents Babylon. The chest represents Medo-Persia. The loin area represents Greece, and the legs represent Rome. These are different pagan kingdoms. So you can see how who would be in Babylon could represent Rome, that wicked pagan city who at that time ruled the known world, calling it Babylon. That would suggest Rome. And notice Peter's in Babylon, probably Rome, and marks with him who he calls his son. Colossians 4, verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow captive, sends you his greetings, and so does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you received instructions to welcome him if he comes to you, referring to Barnabas. So there's this Aristarchus who's a captive, and it looks like Mark is also a captive, possibly, but they're all together in Rome at that time because St. Paul was in Rome. And I'm not showing you the verses, but we surely have that suggested in, in Acts that he's being sent as a prisoner to Rome to uh, speak to the uh, emperor. Second Timothy, te- excuse me, Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 11. Only, again, St. Paul writing, only Luke is with me. Bring Mark along with you, for he is helpful to me in the ministry. So Luke was with um, St. Paul, and he wants Mark, John Mark, to be brought to him. So obviously, John Mark, it appears, ended up being with Paul, and Paul was in Rome, and Peter was in Rome. Philemon chapter 1, only one chapter, verses 23 to 24, sending you greetings is Epaphras, my fellow captive in union with Christ Jesus, also Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. So there's the captive, there's Mark, there was Aristarchus, and there's Luke again. So there are things in the gospel which support what the early church teaches about what happened to Peter in Rome and his crucifixion upside down. Let's put all that aside and just look at the verses in question. John chapter 21, verses 18 through 19. Most truly, this is Lord Jesus speaking to St. Peter. Most truly I say to you, when you were younger, you used to clothe yourself and walk about where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and another will clothe you and carry you where you do not wish. So does that suggest that he's going to be led about so if that's the case, if it was just some invalid, 
he would go where he did not wish. He was St. Peter. He had the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So if these individuals, this another man is a believer, a disciple of him, clothing him, okay, maybe. Caring you where you do not wish? I don't think so. Next verse. He said this to indicate by what sort of death he would glorify God. What? what, what? So your interpretation is that means he's just an old invalid man, he's lost his independence, and other people have to help him. Well, if they're helping him, again, they're not going to be caring where he does not wish. They're going to be caring where he does wish. But wait a minute. This says this is all about what sort of death he would glorify God. Really? After he said this, he said to him, continue following me. So again, but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and another man will clothe you and carry you where you do not wish. Again, my interpretation of that, him stretching out his hands or him stretching out his hands on the cross, another clothes him to be placed on the cross and carrying where he does not wish because he's about to be crucified. And he did not wish that. And again, he said this to indicate by what sort of death he would glorify God. So that verse there, by uh, when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, another man will clothe you and carry you where you don't, no, do not wish, refers to what sort of death St. Peter would glorify God. God. And we have St. Clement of Rome. This was a disciple of St. Paul. AD 90 said in his letter to the Corinthians, let us take the noble examples of our own generation. This is, remember, his generation through jealousy and envy, the greatest and most just pillars of the church were persecuted and came even unto death. Who were the two pillars? St. Paul and St. Peter. Peter, through unjust envy, endured not one or two, but many labors, and at last, having delivered his testimony, departed unto the place of glory due to him. Notice in verse 19, glorifying God, place of glory, brought to death, enduring labors. He finally delivered his testimony. Surely supports what happened uh, that the early church teaches. Continue following me. Now, by the way, here's the Greek interlinear. Akuludimi, be following to me. Now, how that's almost always interpreted, and in fact, in every single English translation, akuludimi means follow me. So every time in every verse in the Bible where that is used, it doesn't have this continue following me, be following to me. It's a command, follow me. Or it can be used, as you see, the sheep follow him in John 10, 4. So it's follow. Just like in English, I can say, he, I follow, they follow, but then I can also command a person, follow. So that's a command, follow me. So remember that. John chapter 21, verses 15 through um, 17 here. And I have a video uh, above uh, in the New Testament treasures playlist that goes into this in detail. When they had finished breakfast, this is uh, Lord Jesus Simon Peter and um, other of the disciples. Si uh, uh, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, Jonas, do you love me more than these? He replied to him. Notice the idea of do you love me? He replied to him, yes, Lord, you know I have affection for you. I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Again, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, son of Jonas, do you love me? He replied, yes, Lord, you know that I have affection for you. and You know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my little sheep or my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, son of Jonas, do you have affection for me? Do you love me? Peter became grieved that he asked him the third time, do you have affection for me? Do you love me? So he said to him, Lord, you are aware of all things. You know that I have affection for you. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my little sheep. So interestingly, feed my lambs, shepherd my sheep, feed my sheep. In the video above, I think what this suggests, feeding my lambs is providing spiritual nourishment to the, your, my, the, the disciples, the other disciples, shepherd my sheep, you know, create my church, build my church, and then feed my sheep, provide spiritual nourishment to my church. Notice there are these three statements and it's about loving him. What are we taught? John 14, 15, if you love me, you observe my commandments. So if you love Lord Jesus, you'll follow his commandments. What's his final commandment? Matthew 20, verses 19 to 20, go therefore and make disciples of people of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things I have commanded you. Here's his last commandment. 
So if you love him, you're going to do his commandments. And his final commandment, you would argue, is his most important commandment. And look, I am with you all the days until the conclusion of the system of things. Notice that. The name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. One way to interpret that is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit share a name, right? And what's the name of the Father? Jehovah. Oh, that would suggest that Jehovah is the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. So that would suggest that the Son also has the name Jehovah, which is, of course, the name of God, proving that the Son is God. And the Holy Spirit has a name. Forces don't have name. Peoples have name. Again, that's just one interpretation. But check this out. And look, I am with you. So I am with you. So in the Greek, ero metimon emi, I am with you. What's interesting is if you go back to Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, where they define the child's name will be Emmanuel, which is translating God is with us. Notice in the Greek, it's metimon o theos, with us the God. So notice Matthew's gospel begins with the infant Lord Jesus. His name is Emmanuel which means with us is the God. And then it ends with the final verse with Lord Jesus saying, I with you am. So to me, that is a example of Lord Jesus spiritually in in the gospel, Holy Spirit inspired writers showing it again. It starts with the baby, Lord Jesus, having a name with us is the God. That would suggest he's God. And notice how it ends. Eroami, I am. And of course, that's very important in John's gospel. Putting that aside, I am with you. Methimon, methimon. Interesting. Now, John chapter 13, verses 36 to 38. Remember this whole idea of following me. Uh, Simon Peter said to him, to Lord Jesus, Lord, where are you going? Remember, this is right about to where he's what? He's about to be crucified, to physically die, to glorify God, right? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. Peter said to him, Lord, why is it I cannot follow you now? I will surrender my life in your behalf. Ooh, so following him surely suggests how Peter's interpreting all this to be surrendering his life. That's not just dying as an old man who can't be carried around or can't take care of himself and lost his independence. He's surrendering his life, right? That's what following seems to mean. Jesus answered, will you surrender your life in my behalf? Most truly I say to you, a rooster will by no means crow until you have disowned me three times or betrayed me. Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. Hmm. Following me seems to be what? To be crucified? to be sacrificed and glorify God in that manner? Lord, why is it I cannot follow you now? I will surrender my life in your behalf. So ooh, he wants to follow him now and surrender his life. So following he means surrendering his life, right? <laughs> getting sacrificed, getting crucified, getting killed, executed, not just being carried around as an old man. I will surrender my life in your behalf. And remember that Greek word, akuludemi? It's the same word. Akuludise, akuludisis, akuludin. John chapter 18, verses 15 through 18 here. Now Simon Peter, as well as another disciple, was following Jesus. This is obviously John. That disciple was known to the high priest, and he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the door. So notice John, the beloved disciple, was at the foot of the cross with Lord Jesus and went with him into uh, the high priest's uh, uh, house. Uh, So the other disciple, John, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. So John brings Peter in, into this area. The servant girl, who was the doorkeeper, then said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Ukemi. So it's not eroemi, it's I am not. Ukemi. Now the slaves and the officers were standing around a charcoal fire they had made because it was cold and they were warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Notice notice Simon Peter, as well as another disciple, was following, and that word is the same word, interestingly, ikuludi. Continuing, verses 25 to 27 in John 18. Now Simon Peter was standing there warming himself right by that charcoal fire. Then they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied and said, I am not ukemi, right? Or the opposite of eroemi. One of the slaves of the high priest who was a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off said, I saw you in the garden with him, did I not? However, Peter denied it again 
and immediately a rooster crowed. So notice he betrayed the Lord, he denied the Lord, he disowned the Lord three times, which would possibly, obviously, be connected to the three do you love me statements of Lord Jesus. So, I think it's pretty obvious that every point this individual makes is false. The sign was above his head, not above his hands. It doesn't say hands. It doesn't say head and hands. It says head. And John's gospel says what it says. There were marks of nails in his hands. And this idea of St. Peter losing his independence and being guided around, and think about it, read that verse again and again and again, well, you surely cannot, it appears, interpret that verse, whatever. And here's why. You've been taught lies if you're a Jehovah's Witness by the Watchtower. Okay, I've shown over and over again that they are pretty much wrong about every interpretation, and they're surely wrong about everything we just talked about here. So I pray that you see this, because I want you to join the family of Lord Jesus. I want you to have eternal life. And the only way you can have eternal life is to see and believe upon the true Lord Jesus, not some satanic watchtower taught counterfeit. And thus you will receive everlasting life and be raised on the last day and join the family of God, which is my prayer. I pray this book truth and interpret Holy Scripture correctly so that this discussion might have been a blessing to you, the viewer and listener. All truth comes from God. Any errors were my own. If it was a blessing to you, I would greatly appreciate if you could like, comment, share it, subscribe to the channel. Lord willing, we shall meet again. May the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless us all. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.